Welcome to It's Your Life with hosts Joyce Wheeler, who will empower you to live a happy, healthy, natural life. You're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. Welcome. You're listening to It's Your Life, Live It to the Fullest. I am your host, Joyce Wheeler. Today is Friday, June 17th, 2016. You're listening to Haggy Shack Radio and Wolf Spirit Radio. Please remember that we're listener-sponsored, so click that donate button and show us some love. Tonight, I am here with Hannah Crum. She is the Kabucha Mama, founder of the Kabucha Camp Workshop, which evolved into kabuchacamp.com. When she partnered with husband Alex Ligori. Oops, excuse me. Kabuchi Camp's mission is changing the world one gut at a time, which is accomplished through empowering others to safely brew kombucha at home, providing quality information, quality supplies, and quality support. Along with partner Al- Alex Ligori, Han is also an industry, an industry journalist and master brewer directly mentoring thousands of new and experienced kombucha brewers and providing consultation services for kombucha startups since 2007. Together, Hannah and Alex also co-founded Kombucha Brewers International in 2014 to support the commercial kombucha industry by promoting and protecting access to bottled kombucha around the world, where Hannah serves as president. Their 400-page full color, The Big Book of Kabucha, from Stony Publishing, debuted in March of 2016 and has already gained much acclaim. Hannah is also a leader and featured speaker in the real food movement, using the kabucha lifestyle as an introduction to other fermented foods, gut health, the human microbiome, bacteria, and more. Welcome to the show, Hannah. Thanks for having me, Joyce. I'm excited to be here. Well, thank you. I'm excited to have you here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you originally from? Where did you grow up? What was your family life like? Do you have any siblings? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm originally from the Midwest. I was uh, born in Des Moines, Iowa, as were my siblings. Uh, we're three all together. I'm the oldest of the three. And um, and then when I was about seven years old, we moved to Illinois, where I spent the, the majority of my adulthood until I moved to California in 2001. But um, in Illinois, I lived in Chicago, the Chicago area suburbs. I always was grateful to grow up in the Midwest. I have fond memories of the humidity, the lightning bugs, and frozen nose hairs in the winter, but I'm super grateful to have escaped to the California sunshine um, here in the rest of my life. But uh, I... I went to University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, and I majored in Mandarin, Chinese, and Spanish. So I have two bachelor's degrees. They don't equal a master's, <laughs> but um, I was fortunate to receive a fellowship uh, to travel and study in Taiwan, where I really was able to you know, learn the language. It's a tough language to learn. And even after studying it for two years with a class every single day in college uh, for two years in a row, when I landed, I could barely make a sentence. And uh, of course, once you know, the first day I land, we land late at night. I had met someone on the plane. So we went to, you know, just a small town in Taiwan to get some street food late at night. Um, something you can't even really do conveniently here in LA, maybe in New York or bigger cities, but um, we tend to close early here. So I'm standing in line with all these uh, Chinese people, and I'm the only foreigner, and this giant cockroach like flies on me, and I start freaking out. <laughs> and I mean, you can just imagine the scene. I'm I'm a fairly tall woman, and so to be screaming and hollering there in Taiwan, not able to speak a word. It was uh, it was very entertaining, but it was a wonderful experience. The funny thing is, I didn't learn about kombucha until after I had been in Asia. So, um, you know, of course, there's part of me that wishes I knew about it beforehand, so I could have uh, endeavored to learn more about it when I was there. But, uh, you know, I think my... Uh, my interest in Asian culture from watching movies, from living in Taiwan, from, um, you know, studying feng shui and, and Taoism and all these things, they've, uh, it's kind of interesting that this Asian originally, uh, or originated beverage came into my life as it did. So, um, who knows, right? The universe provides. That's right. 
So what kind of, what, what did your parents do for a living? What kind of upbringing did you have? Um, my parents uh, were, my dad was blue collar, so he did, um, you know, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, but they were also entrepreneurs. And um, my mother primarily did support jobs, you know, working in customer service. She also helped my my uh, dad in the business uh, before uh, they separated and she moved back to California. Uh, but I think that's part of where my entrepreneurial spirit came from is seeing my parents um, living their own life, making their own business, doing it their own way, and uh, got a lot of good life lessons out of uh, observing them and how they work together. So did they have any interest in your interest in the Asian culture? Well, actually, it was because we used to rent foreign films all the time. My dad is always um, eschewed mainstream, and we didn't have a TV when I was growing up. I didn't have a TV until I was about 10 years old. So I grew up running around outdoors, reading books, and I've always had that kind of um, curious mind, and I loved reading Wish I could, I wish I had more time to do it these days, but, uh, suffice to say, uh, it definitely implanted a love of nature as well as a love of reading at a young age. And then, um, because we didn't watch the, you know, standard mainstream television shows and when videos came out, I know I'm, I'm dating myself here, um, we, <laughs> we got a video subscription and we would just, uh, rent videos and foreign films was at the top of the list along with kind of art films, avant-garde films. So I got quite an interesting uh, cultural experience. And I think really it was watching these, you know, rebellious women, Gong Li, all these Gong Li movies. She's like this rebellious female woman who's standing up, but also the rich colors of their clothing, the sounds of their language, the um, Beijing opera. I love the sounds of Jingju. It just has this, you know, very specific um, sound to it. And I think I just kind of fell in love with Asian culture through that. And so it was really interesting to then go to Asia and and live there. And, you know, it's very different when, um, you know, and I'm I'm certainly speaking from my own perspective, you know, uh, to go to a foreign country where you're a minority, but you're treated differently than minorities say in like in the United States are treated, you know, over there, you're kind of seen as this celebrity, you know, everyone wants to be your friend and you speak English and they can show you off to other people if they hang out with you or they can practice their English with you. And so it was a very different cultural experience, I think, um, as a foreign woman living in Asia than it might be <laughs> foreign women living in the United States. It might be a little bit of a different uh, experience there. Right. Um, being raised, born and raised in Chicago myself, I'm actually curious as to where in Illinois you live. Skokie, yeah. So I went to school uh-huh. in Niles North. Yeah, North Suburbs. And I love being so close to the city. You know, when you're a kid, you like, oh, man, school, suburbs, this sucks. I want to go to the city. I want to hang out in the city. And that was fun. And we had access to do that because we could just take the train anytime. But looking back, I really value the education I received in Illinois. And in fact, it was in Skokie where I took my first Spanish class when I was 12. It was just required for every student to do that. And even though I didn't have the best grades, my teacher clearly saw something in me because she encouraged me to continue my language study. So I kind of gave up the other um, electives, which, again, I'm sure kids these days would kill to have shop class and photography and um, home ec and, you know, all the things that were, you know, kind of normal um, that now these days pe- many people don't have access to. But I, I traded all those in for language classes. So I started studying Spanish when I was 12. I then continued Spanish in high school and added French as a second language, which was fairly easy because, you know, they're romance languages. So um, I understood the concept of conjugating verbs, which honestly is one of the hardest things to learn um, in a foreign language because when you speak your own native tongue, you take all of that information for granted and uh, uh, you don't realize that you're even conjugating verbs because you you just do it uh, automatically. But um, Chinese was very different. So then when I went to college, and I took a few years off between high school and college, just I worked and I traveled in Europe and did a few things. I think it's great for people to take a little time off between those, especially if you're not sure what you want to study as I much agree. as... Yeah, I mean, I don't know what your trajectory was. Did you um, did you take a gap year at all? Um, actually, um, I dropped out. <laughs> uh, I just, I, I thought that high school was going to be a place that I could go to kind of like dabble in things I was interested in to find out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Mm. And when I found out that it was just more rigmarole of what I was already went through 
grammar school. Mm-hmm. I just kind of went, you know what, I this isn't what I signed up for. Well, and, you know, I think it's really uh, what you're discussing speaks to the concept of how valuable it is to have um, contact with all different kinds of things. And that's why I think it's really sad that schools these days don't have access to these, you know, music programs. I was in swing choir. I played an instrument. You know, I did all these things that, you know, if I had decided to excel in any of them, I certainly could have pursued, but I never would have known I had any aptitude or talent or desire to do so if I didn't have the exposure in the first place. And same with foreign language, you know. Um, now these days to get into university, it's almost required, which I think is a good thing. I think it's valuable to speak other languages, be able to communicate with other cultures. Traveling is a great way to learn about yourself by seeing how people do it differently. Um, right, I agree. But, you know, at the same time, that's one thing I really loved about Chicago was the diversity. Agreed, you know? 100%. You know, I applied to schools like IU Bloomington, and I'm going to sound weird when I say this, but honestly, there was not enough diversity for me. There were just... Uh, or sometimes we, you know, we drive to Minnesota to go visit the relatives. We stop in Wisconsin. I'm like, I've never seen such a monogenous, uh, homogenous rather, um, culture. I'm just, I'm used to there being diversity and it was really great in Skokie. You know, we had people from all different ethnicities and backgrounds and languages and we all played together and grew up together and there really was no, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, everyone had their cultural club, which was fun and cool to celebrate their cultures, but um, it was really wonderful growing up in that diversity. I agree with you. Agree. It wasn't, you know, not just the cultures, but the food. It's one thing yes. that's about Chicago is having that diverse, you know, the diversity in food. And one thing I dreaded about moving to the South was my kids, because when we moved to the South, my youngest was six, that I had eight and 13. And one of the things that I was kind of like concerned about was them not having the diversity mm. of cultures and people that we had, that they had access to in Chicago. And- yeah, exactly. And you know, one of the, one of the things that Kombucha has taught me, and this is, you know, getting ahead of ourselves here, but is that, you know, um, diversity is nature. Right. When we walk out of our doors, we don't see one kind of grass, one kind of tree, one kind of bird. There's a whole diversity of those things exactly. present. And exactly. it's that diversity that creates a healthy environment. And I think that, you know, humans have a lot to learn from nature, considering we are nature. But just modeling nature, I think, would would be so wise, you know. Um, I agree. I, I can't agree more. There's yeah. been <laughs> where after, after it rains, I look out in the driveway and the birds are real active and they're out there because things are, have, you know, fallen and are, are brought up from the rain. And I look out the window and I see all these different birds sitting there and eating together. And I'm like, look at them. You know, nobody's caring that one's a blue jay, one's a cardinal, one's a sparrow. Mm-hmm. They don't care. They're just like, yeah, you know, buffet, time to eat, guys, let's go. And, exactly you know, right. I agree. We have a lot to learn from nature. So well, and they're probably not looking at the blue jay going, you're blue, that's weird. You know what I mean? Like, it's, there's there's this uh, lack of, and it's not to say there isn't competition. Competition is normal and it's healthy and it's appropriate when it isn't intended to dominate or totally eliminate something else, right? Um, you know, and that's another thing we can talk about too with the kombucha is healthy competition is really a vital part of a healthy culture as well but there's still this basic respect that i think is vital to cultivate and you know like you colleen i didn't realize until uh i'm sorry joyce i I didn't realize until i had moved out of that environment and saw more homogenous types of cultures where i really appreciated the fact that i grew up with so much diversity excuse me yeah, that's, that's, it's really important. And we, the thing is too, is that we don't realize that we can learn so much from each other, from the diversity and just by talking and engaging in conversation with each other. So what originally drew you to Taiwan? Well, okay, so I think, first of all, I got a fellowship. My my professor was really encouraging me to go to mainland China, but as we all know, they had the Cultural Revolution, and they've been dominated by communism. So it's a much more restrictive type of culture, and Taiwan, I knew, had had 
been the where the Kuomintang had fled to. So the Democratic Party of Taiwan, I mean of China, had fled to Taiwan during the Cultural Revolution. And in fact, many of the beautiful artifacts that were um, potentially in line to be destroyed during the Cultural Revolution were saved. And there's a really beautiful museum there, um, the Taiwan National Museum, which features many of these ancient Chinese treasures. And what I really loved about Taiwan once I got over there was um, that it there's a place for all religion. Like you might go to the Buddhist temple one day and get a blessing and then go to the Taoist temple and then you're going to church on Sunday. And all of those things can live together seamlessly, again, because I think um, Asian culture very much honors the gray, right, because of the yin-yang, because of their kind of inherent understanding that life is not all black or all white. There's always a little dot of either in, right. in both of those concepts that it, it isn't married to this very didactic all or nothing kind of mentality that we get raised with in this culture here in the United States. And so um, there's a, a real fluidity, a real flexibility. And in fact, I feel that I truly understood Taoism by driving a scooter in Taiwan. Now imagine, you know, the streets are crazy. Crowded with cars, they're crowded with scooters, and all of my other American counterparts ended up in accidents, and I was the only one who didn't. And I think what saved me is I was able to release, you know, in America we have the white lines and the yellow lines, and we all stay within them, and we put on our blinkers, we look over our shoulders, and then we move over, right? There's very much a, a regulated way in which we try to work with each other in traffic. In Taiwan, it's very different. It's very much like the flow of water, so what I learned was that I had to let go of trying to look behind me and control what was happening behind me, only focus on what was happening in front of me, because people would make sudden shifts in different directions, and you would just have to respond to that. But everyone was always trusting that the person behind them was making that um, that adjustment. And so that's what I did, and, and it really allowed me to be in the flow, which is what Taoism is, and um, and to just kind of be part of the, you know, it's almost like water molecules, right? How the oxygen and the hydrogen, those bonds break and they come back together. That's that's kind of what it feels like in terms of that that process. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm imagining that. I never thought about it like that, just watching, you know, things on TV and seeing the traffic and the way people are driving. I'm like, that's crazy. This seems like there is no rhyme or reason to it. It just seems totally sporadic, you know, the, the way that they're going. Mm-hmm, totally. <laughs> How are these people still alive? <laughs> and yet they are, right? And the and if anything, yeah. if you tried to put them into a more rigid um, system, they don't do as well. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that is very interesting. So when did you get it? What year was this that you were in Taiwan or from what year to what year? 98 to about um, 98 to 99 was my school year. And then I went back in 2000. Um, and uh, lived there for another six months, and then it was soon after that that I moved to California in 2001. So then, in when did you get interested in kombucha or well, learn about kombucha? It was soon, soon thereafter. So a couple of years after living in California, a friend of mine from college, from Champaign Urbana, had moved up to San Francisco. So in 2003, I went up there to visit him, and I got a tour of his very groovy apartment. You know, there were at this time I'm still standard American diet, microwave, my food, ramen cereal and milk, you know, all of the kind of standard things that we grew up eating and are normal for um, for our culture and society, but aren't necessarily the best choices. Um, sure. So I get to his his apartment and we go first in the bathroom. And what is there? There's a, sh- there's a filter on the shower. Now, of course, I knew about filtering my drinking water and that made, that, of course, makes sense. And then once I saw that filter, I was like, oh my gosh, Right, get the chlorine off of my skin, then my skin won't be dried out, it won't have that weird scratchy feeling, and so I was inspired to, you know, now I have a whole house filter with a fluoride filter um, for my drinking water, you know, so that inspired that change. We went into the kitchen, and in the kitchen was not the kombucha, but they had this other stuff called sole which is a pink Himalayan rock salt. I'd never seen this kind of salt before. I grew up with Morton's. Uh, there's a giant pile of it next to the highway in Chicago getting rained down with uh, who knows what kind of weird chemicals as right. cars drive by. Um, but this pink salt, I'd never seen pink salt. And then they were drinking salt water, 
which was just, you know, the, the old line about salt, like salt's bad for you, the hypertension, the this and that. It was just like, whoa, and people are drinking this on purpose and it's good for you. And so it kind of opened me up to the concept of humans as batteries, right? We need a certain amount of minerals in our body and diets for our brains to even process correctly because we're, we're kind of an electronic, uh, an electrical impulse machine. And, um, even then looking into, because I'm such a word nerd, right, the root word for salary comes from salt because it was so valuable. People were paid in salt. And it's um, it's a true detriment to our culture that, you know, we, you know, this kind of important, valuable information about what's actually nutritious has been somewhat obfuscated or at least replaced with foods that don't actually provide the nutrition that their original counterparts did. Um, and then... There was a table in a room with a box, and in the box there were jars. The jars were covered with cloths, and I go, that's the kombucha. I never heard of it. It's this weird word. It's floating in there. There's like dangly things. I have no idea what it is, but the word sticks in your mind because it's so intriguing. And we didn't even try it because it wasn't ready. It wasn't done brewing. But um, I got back to L.A., and, of course, um, I go to the Whole Foods, and lo and behold, there's an entire case of kombuchas there. So I grab one off the shelf, gingerade, I crack it open in the store, and I have my first sip. And you know how memory loves to embellish. And uh, in the book, I call this kombucha kismet. Basically, the clouds opened up, the light shone down, the angels were singing, and literally every nerve ending in my body was electrified because you can taste the life in this beverage. It's yeah. uh living organisms, the enzymes, the healthy organic acids. It was, and it's a little tangy. Like, I don't know if you remember the first time you tried kombucha, Joyce, but there's that like, there's like this little electricity or a little punch um, that goes through your system, especially if you're not accustomed to it. And and that just, I really enjoyed that little jolt of electricity I got from it. What did you think of kombucha when you tried it for the first time? Actually, searching my mind as you're, as you're reminiscing about your experience with it, and I'm going, wow, I really can't remember the first time I tried it. I'm trying to think if it was at the farmer's market or if I had actually bought some at a health store. Um, I, I do remember that, you know, it wasn't anything that I thought it was like, that I felt was like, oh, this is so good. I want, you know, I want some more. I, I did on one hand. The other hand, I, I tell people all the time, it's either you like it or you don't. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, when you taste the kombucha, I, I had some uh, some neighbors over the other night, and they never had any. And I said, well, here, you know, taste some of it. And they both tasted it, and the one of them made this horrible face. That's kombucha face, totally. A lot of people make that face. They go, ooh, and it all pinches up. <laughs> but I knew it was, I, I knew that it was loaded with a lot of good stuff, and therefore, you know, I, I my body craved it. Exactly I, right. And I think a lot of people, even if that first sip is is not good, their body ends up craving it. Colleen says she loves the tart tang of kombucha. It's good stuff. And that's what this was. This was like a little punch in the face. Now, here's the reality. I was the girl sneaking the pickle juice out of the pickle jar. My mom was yelling at me for doing it. But, man, that salty, sour. And it wasn't even like traditionally fermented pickles. So it wasn't like super great for me, but I just, I love that flavor and I love that salt. And maybe my body was craving the salt, but, um, you know, it was so delicious to me and it was reminiscent of that. It was like drinking pickle juice, which was something I really enjoyed as a kid. So for me, it was just like, yes, this is amazing. But you know, it was still five bucks a bottle at that time. And, you know, I quickly, my thirst outgrew my budget, but I had seen that box of mysterious jars, and I'm like, what the heck? I can give this a try. You know, what is, how hard can it be? So, again, this coming from someone who doesn't really cook their food, uh, using a microwave and things like that. So, for me to kind of make this decision was a little outside my, my comfort zone, but, um, I did. I, I, I went to the library. I checked out every book on kombucha I could find. I read all the books. I, sourced a culture locally. LA is a very big city and um, is actually the birthplace of commercial, commercially bottled kombucha. Um, and I just, I started making my own and I can tell you those first few batches probably were not the most amazing um, tasting. And, you know, it's definitely an art and a craft, but over time I, I really fell in love with the process and, you know, it was in 2004. So the next year I was taking an artist way workshop and, um, are you familiar with the artist way? Uh-oh. Do you know do you know that at all? Well, 
Well, the artist way is a, it's kind of loosely based on a 12 step program, but it's a. Looks like Skype has lost the call and is trying to get it back. All right. I'm back. I'm back. All righty. Okay. Uh, Hannah, the thanks. last thing I heard you say that was something about two thousand and four and taking an artist, yes. and that then then you dropped out. Okay, great. I was talking about the artist way, and in fact, I was asking if if either of you are familiar with it at all, the artist way. No, I, it, it was actually it comes from like kind of the mid nineties. I used to work in bookstores, and so I remember when the book came out. In fact, it turns out the author was from or lived in Chicago, and in fact had been developing her course um, there, I believe. And so it was quite popular in the bookstores. And while I scoffed at it in my younger age, when I came to, I was in LA, and I took a workshop version of it, which just helped with more accountability. But basically, it's a twelve-week program where every morning you write what are called morning pages. They're just three pages is longhand. You're just kind of getting the yuck out. And then you go on these artist dates where you take yourself to the museum or you take yourself to do things that as an adult, we kind of don't really allow ourselves to do because we're grown-ups and we're adulting. Um, I think it's become more popular for people to uh, indulge their creative side a little bit more. But at the time, it was very much a revelation for me. And it was through this creative process that I discovered what I really wanted to do was to teach others about kombucha. Now, I was living in L.A. at the time, and I was like many Angelinos. Um, you know, as a child in the Midwest, I had done some community theater and taken some theater classes. And so in L.A., I was exploring the, the big question, what if? What if I had attempted to pursue this? What would happen? So um so I had various and sundry, you know, jobs that were supporting that. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, the very last acting class I was in, we were able to um, do workshops or, like, do little scenes. And so the scene that I put up was me teaching kombucha. It's just kind of funny how naturally I evolved and, and it kind of passed the baton for me. And... Um, and that was uh and that was a real revelation i was and that's when i started kombucha camp so this was a little workshop in my home in california in los angeles my tiny little guest house i'd invite people over um i teach them all about the process introduce them to the culture sample the brews and just really enjoyed educating people now my husband um who's also my partner and co-author at the time, he was like, what are you teaching people? This stuff is so easy. All you do is you make tea. What's so hard about this? And I was like, I hear you, but what's really daunting and scary for people is this culture. It's unfamiliar. Right. People are concerned. Is it safe? And things like that. And so that was really more than anything what I was doing was just allaying people's fears and bridging that gap, right? We're used to our grandparents or our mothers or fathers or people teaching us the skills we need. And these traditions, the traditions of fermentation, of preservation, have been passed down from generation to generation. But here in the United States, because of the processed foods boom, we've kind of lost a few of generations have lost this knowledge and information and so there's a lack of trust there's a huge amount of fear and so I was not on purpose but picking up that that torch and carrying that forward I I think it's more than just a few generations who have have lost that touch and Colleen made a comment when you were talking about the scabby she was like OMG the blob (laughs) <laughs> totally the blob, the alien. I mean, there's so many names for it, uh, yeah. mushroom, uh, things like that. My only concern was to keep everything clean so I didn't ruin the batch. That was my biggest concern was hearing about all the first-time brewers who landed up with bacteria, bad bacteria, uh, in, in their kombucha, and they needed to get rid of it. But well, imagine this. I mean, when kombucha first came to the United States, and I don't have, you know, hard evidence, but just from talking to people, it was kind of like a chain letter or, you know, you would get this letter with these instructions. You'd get this weird baggie of blobby weird stuff. You didn't even know what it was, and you followed these rules. And, of course, again, there wasn't a lot of information, and so what the heck are you eating? What are you consuming? Is this dangerous or not? But, um, you know, a lot of people went on faith back then, and uh, thankfully they did because – uh, I'm sure they turned out okay. You know, the reality of kombucha is is that it's incredibly safe to make at home. In fact, it's probably safer than making chicken or other types of food at home. And the reason for that is the low pH, 
So the pH of kombucha is typically a 2.5 to 3.5. It's very acidic. And, um, you know, many people would worry, oh, well, I'm not supposed to consume acidic foods because that will throw off the homeostasis in my body. The reality is that unlike other acidic foods such as the acid in a soda, these are healthy organic acids that put nutrition back into the body. So very similar to citrus juice, grapefruit juice, things like that where they have that sour pH. When they get into the body, they're actually um, alkalizing because they're putting minerals back in, not taking them out. Now that's interesting to know because that's something I didn't know. And at one point, my, my acidity level, I was at, 5.0. Mm. And I thought it was because I was drinking a lot of kombucha at the time, so I gave it up. So I did not know that it, you know, it was like, say a lemon is the same way. You know, it's acidic, but once it gets into your system, it's alkaline. Let me ask you about this. Before we start really going into kombucha, let's talk about the history of kombucha. Where did it actually start? Well, and that's, that's a fantastic question. We did a lot of research for the book. And, and the reality is, and part of why I started my website was I would go online, I'd research kombucha, but all the information would tell the same story without providing a reference. And that drove me crazy because I'm like, but where's the original source um, that says this is accurate? And, you know, of course, our, our best guess is that it came from Asia, being that it's a tea-based ferment. Tea, of course, um, the Chinese discovered uh you know, thousands of years ago, they've been consuming it for thousands of years. And um, fermentation is an ancient practice. And, of course, we know uh, Asians have been fermenting just like other human humans have since time immemorial. So it really stands to reason that it comes from somewhere in Asia. But does it come from China? Does it come from Japan? Does it come from Korea? There are several different legends and stories about it. For instance, one of one story says that it comes from 212 BC when the Qin Shi Huangdi, that was the emperor who united China in the first place, uh, he drank something called Lingzhi that uh, was a tea of immortality. Well, if you look up Lingzhi, it actually refers to reishi mushrooms. Now, here's what the confusing part. Kombucha has been called mushroom tea. Right. Um, and the reason it was called a mushroom is just very much like a kefir grain. doesn't actually look like a grain. It's more crystal if it's a water kefir or it looks like cauliflower if it's a milk kefir. It's just a term of convenience based on what, you know, ancient people might have thought it looked like not understanding that there were microbes. So the the scoby itself can sometimes look like a smooth mushroom cap. So it's often been called mushroom tea. So in my for my money, you know, and when I ask Chinese people in my uh, unofficial <laughs> surveys, you know, I go, is lingzhi the same as kombucha or hong cha jing? And they're like, no, definitely not the same thing at all. So I think there was just a little bit of confusion about that. So it may not be as old as that. Um there's another story that says in 414 AD there was an ailing emperor in Japan and a doctor from Korea was sent over to cure him. And supposedly he was Dr. Kombu, which to be realistic does not actually make sense. It's not a Korean name. It's not a Korean last name. But when I did the research for the book, what we found is um, that there was a doctor who had a much longer name that I'm not going to be able to pronounce here, but it did have a K as an initial um, form. Who did help, who did help an emperor? And then there's some other legends of kombucha saying that it was, um, an ant that they put into the tea or some kind of insect they put into the tea and it grew into this thing that then they drank and it cured them. The interesting thing about that story is that one of the theories that came out of the turn of the century, the 20th century in Russia, was that the bacteria was carried on the legs of insects. And as they landed in a sweet tea substrate, maybe somebody, as we imagine it, someone left it out on their windowsill, they forgot about it, a bug got into it, but the bacteria and the wild yeast present ended up creating a scoby. And it used to be humans uh, relied a lot more on trusting their instincts. Someone tasted it, recognized the vitality of what they were drinking, and then cultivated it from there. You know, the reality is we may never know where it came from, but definitely right. com- there was no Dr. Kombu. Now, where does the name come from? And pardon me if I'm just talking ad infinitum here. Um, <laughs> uh, kombu is a type of brown seaweed from Japan, and they drink a kombu cha, which is the seaweed in, in hot water, and it's a seaweed tea, basically. Well, the strands of yeast that hang off of the culture are also brown. So were they like the misnomer of mushroom, giving it a misnomer of kombu, and yet the name has stuck, kombucha. 
So this also speaks to the history we have where the Russians claim they learned about it first from the Japanese during the Sino-Japanese War, which was in the late 1800s. Now, part of that war was fought in China and Russia, as well as on the Shandong Peninsula, which is um, just to the north of where Korea is. So it's kind of this interesting confluence of all of those areas uh, coming together. And, um, you know, who knows if that was the exact origins or not, but um, the Russians definitely credit, credit it as coming from Asia, even though it has had a really long history in their traditional beverages since uh, the early 1900s. Now, what about India? You would think India might have something to do with kombucha, but the reality is I've not found a lot of evidence or information for that. They do also consume tea, and we do imagine that, as things were traded along the trade routes, that it might have eventually made its way to India. Unfortunately, we just haven't found enough evidence for that to be true, but I am still open to figuring that stuff out. Now, what we do know is that I've done a lot of research in trying to figure out if it's Tibetan in origin, because that's been one of the things that people have said. And while the people of Tibet do drink a lot of tea and they consume what's called butter tea where they take the tea leaves itself and they'll preserve them. I scoured through loads of dictionaries just trying to find any words that discuss fermenting tea and I really could not find anything that pointed to that. So suffice to say we're still uh, on a hunt and uh, because I speak Chinese I'm hopeful that at some point I'll get to do a research tour to Asia and even though I don't speak Russian, would love to get to Russia and dig into some of the older research from from those times and just, you know, kind of see we, how far back we can trace it. But like the origins of mankind, we may never find the true origin. And you know what? I'm fine with that because what I do know is it um, makes people feel good uh, and improves digestion, increases energy, and people just really love it. Yeah, it's really interesting because I've, like, come across some stuff when – I was doing research, and I, I can't give an example right now, but certain things that I was looking for, like with you, were trying to figure out how the, where the kombucha came from, and it's just like it's like dead end after dead end after dead end. You've got these various stories of might have, could have, you right. know, it just uncertainty. And um, when I do my research, I'm looking for consistencies. I'm looking mm-hmm. for continuous consistencies, which obviously you are too, and they're just not there. So it's like, wow, you know, where did this come from? Where did it start? So I find it really interesting that your research at this point has kind of led you still to go, and you know what? It's still not sure where kombucha started. Well, in the Bible, they mentioned Ruth's vinegary beverage. So being that kombucha is tea vinegar, there's certainly vinegars have been consumed. And the reality is we couldn't drink the water, right? We've never been able to drink the water just because there's potential contaminants in it. And so we've always either put a little vinegar in there or fermented the water. In fact, they they now theorize that um, Egyptians, ancient Egyptians started growing grain not for bread but for beer. So humans have always understood that fermentation is, you know, we co-evolved with fermentation. It's been a vital part of our existence as human beings. And um, it's, uh, it, but what we do know is that it became very popular in Europe uh, in the early 1900s and then uh, was very popular all the way through World War II when rationing kicked in, right? And what were they rationing? Tea and sugar. What is kombucha made with? Tea and sugar. So it makes a lot of sense that when you weren't able to get the raw materials needed to produce the drink, that it kind of disappeared or went in different directions. Now, what's really cool is we found um, through all of our searches and studies, we unearthed that there was a song written about kombucha in the 1950s in Italy called Stu Fungo Canese. So Fungo Canese means, uh, you know, fungus Chinese, Chinese fungus, uh, which is one of the many names for kombucha. And uh, it was just this really cute song in Neapolitan. Uh, I don't totally know it. It, like, lives in a bowl and it grows, 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 but it's this really cute, catchy tune, and it was so exciting to see this uh, this sort of mainstream cultural uh, touchstone featuring kombucha at a time when, um, and in a place where I didn't know it had that type of presence, but here was the problem in Italy. Like I mentioned before, it was kind of this chain letter thing. Well, people started stealing 
a holy water out of the fonts at the churches to make their kombucha more special. And you can imagine the priests were none too happy about that. And they started uh, disclaiming kombucha and telling people not to drink it because uh, too many people were stealing the holy water. Wow. So you had mentioned that there's different names for kombucha? Yes. And uh, the book has quite a few of these names and then different names from different languages. Uh, so it's oftentimes these names refer to the perceived benefits of kombucha. So if that's the tea of immortality, the tea of long life, the mushroom of, mor- of immortality, the um, the tea of charity, uh, there's all kinds of um, uh, jellyfish to uh, gout jellyfish. I mean, these are some of the translations from the German names. Um, there's just... there. Japanese or Chinese is often in those names, attributing it back to Asia. So even in the names for kombucha, we have an attribution to Asia as well. So um, it's kind of interesting that it has maintained this reputation through to current times. But of course, as we know, uh, modern research hasn't done all the double-blind clinical trials that we imagine are happening for drugs that get approved by the FDA, although considering the number of side effects and negative effects those things can have on people. It makes you wonder how rigorous those are. But suffice to say that kombucha has been studied for 150 years. Um, some of the earliest research, as I mentioned, coming out of Russia, where in the 1913, A.A. Bashinskaya, a female biologist in, um, I believe it was St. Petersburg, collected kombucha samples from around the entire country of Russia. So for her to be able to do that in 1913 means it already has to have had a presence there for it to have spread so far and wide. Um, people have reported since those times helping with um, diabetes, with um, arteriosclerosis, with lowering blood pressure, um, cholesterol, all kinds of things. So it's had a long reputation of being a folk remedy. And in fact, it used to be sold in Germany in apothecaries. And the former first lady of Germany, Victoria Veronica Carstens, rather, she um, advocated the use of kombucha along with other herbal remedies. And supposedly, Ronald Reagan even drank kombucha. Who knows if they learned about it from the Russians or from the Germans, but um, supposedly he consumed it uh, when he had cancer and uh, consumed it for quite a while. I could never get confirmation from his estate, but i um, hoping someday someone will uh, find me and tell all uh, so we can know for sure if that was true or not. Um, somebody's asking if you're taking questions. Sure. Let me see what their question is. Um, do you want to, while this, um, while Matt is typing right. out yeah. the question, you do you want to let people know where they can go to visit your website? Absolutely. So, um, Kombucha Camp, that's camp with a K because I'm cute and clever like that. Uh, KombuchaCamp.com. We also have a YouTube channel with videos, our Facebook page, um, everywhere on the Internet you can find us there. And then our store, which is store.KombuchaCamp.com, is going to have quality supplies, uh, quality information, and, and quality support for those looking to get into it themselves. We're, we're bacteria farmers, certainly a title I never expected to have uh, growing up. But not only do we cultivate kombucha cultures, we also have jun, which is a cousin of kombucha, so to speak. It's a raw honey green tea ferment. We also have milk kefir and water kefir grains as well. So for folks looking for living cultures, we have all of those there. Um, but if you want to learn how to make kombucha, and maybe a friend gave you a culture, you can always check out kombuchacamp.com backslash kombucha recipe. You can download our free recipe. It has a brewing log, which is also found in the book, as well as a, an email a day for five days, just kind of sharing with you some of the information about kombucha so you get a nice base of, of knowledge that way as well. So let me ask you this. Now, I know, you know, depending upon the flavor, it depends upon how long you want to do your first beer, brew, and there's two brews. So my first brew, I do for 11 days. How long do you do your first brew? 
Um, my primary fermentation, so I do larger size batches. I'm probably doing a two-gallon batch at a time. I typically leave those 10 to 14 days just depending on the conditions. Like if it's warm out, it goes faster. If it's cold out, it might take a little longer. We do use heaters on them in the winter just to keep them in that ideal range of 75 to 85 with 80 being our sweet spot. Um, but in the winter, even with the heaters, sometimes they're a little slower just because their nature and they're tied to those cycles as well. Um, And then when that primary fermentation is done, it has a nice tanginess to it. But honestly, ours is a little sweet when it goes in the bottle. And the reason for that is we'll flavor it with fruit in the in the secondary fermentation. After a couple of days with the fruit or herbs or whatever we put in there, we'll strain that off and then we put it into our bottles. So what what that means, having a little bit extra sweetness to the kombucha when we bottle it means that It'll build better carbonation in the bottle. And then also remember, when wine goes into the bottle, it's grape juice, right? It's really sweet. And it's that process of working with the yeast and bacteria in those anaerobic conditions that yield a different type of flavor. And that's true of our kombucha. So what happens is is instead of getting too vinegary in the bottle, it will dry up and it gets a nice roundness of flavor. uh, And it gets like a sweet sour punch. So you'll get punch in the mouth of the sour, but then the sweet comes behind. It's kind of like eating a Sour Patch Kid, but it's good for you. (laughs) It is like that. You know, I'm sitting here listening to you describe this kabooch, and I'm going, sounds like my kabooch. Yeah. It's like it's sweet, but it's got that punch. Totally. And that's what I like. And that's the teaspoon of sugar that helps the medicine go down, right? You know, what I didn't say before is, you know, as much as ancient people have lauded kombucha and praised it for its benefits, the way we help people think about it is it's just a healthy food, right? I mean, think of all the foods we call superfoods today, goji berries and cacao and, you know, insert food you've never heard of here, superfood, right? Um, It's just a healthy food like all other foods. And, it, you know, we don't rely on kombucha alone. It just happens to have some really wonderful properties being made from tea that um, have been demonstrated to have some really positive effects on the mice and other animals that experiments have done, have, have happened on them. Um, but yeah, that sweet sour punch, we really love it. But it's, the nice thing about it is when you make it at home, it's choose your own adventure. You know, if at first you need a sweeter kombucha because you're bridging away from sodas, do that. In Russia, they would ferment it for a very short period of time in a smaller batch because it was like their soda pop. They didn't have, you know, Coca Cola and Pepsi and any of that stuff until, uh, until the 80s. And so that was their way of getting a kind of sweet, refreshing drink was to not ferment it for as long. Now, we do know that more of the healthy acids are expressed later in the fermentation process, which is why we frequently enjoy the continuous brew, because uh, what that does is it allows for more of those healthy acids to be present, um, but we're also tempering the flavor with the sweet tea. And I can get into the details of that process a little later, but... Um, yeah, I mean, the great thing about kombucha, any way you slice it, you can make any flavor you want. In our book, we have 260 inspirations, everything from your fruits and herbs to bacon and mushrooms and, you know, all kinds of things that you might not have thought of to use to some incredibly complex flavors, which I would consider the advanced flavors, the Ayurvedic ones um, that were inspired by looking at some some uh, remedies for the different doshas. And those have, like, a ton of elements but you put them in there and they have these beautiful, complex, lovely flavors. So um, I highly recommend if anyone's into flavoring their kombucha to check that out just for the flavors alone. Well, I'm going to need to go ahead and do that. Uh, Meanwhile, we do have a, you do have a question. Great. Uh, They say, I'm working on healing my gut, detoxing and balancing possible candida overgrowth. I have heard that kombucha can feed it. Can you recommend the correct dose to start with? This is a fantastic question, and it really um, speaks to our philosophy of trust your gut, right? Like each human organism has a completely different microbiome, completely different makeup, and completely different nutritional needs. And there's no one-size-fits-all solution. And um, But here's what happens with kombucha. If you're buying a commercial brand, Oftentimes because they're trying, you know, they don't like being called tea vinegar. They don't want people to have this negative thought process about their product. Um, and so much of our palate is still wrapped up in those sweet, sugary flavors. So um, 
some of the commercial brands are on the lighter, sweeter side because they're bridging that soda. Now, they're still going to be better for you than a soda, but the problem is if you have candida overgrowth because you're so sensitive to sugar, those might not be appropriate for you to consume and may actually continue to feed the candida. Now, you can buy commercial brands and let them ferment longer on your kitchen counter, provided you're doing that in a safe space. We're coming into summer, which gets really hot. And uh, and if it's a living product, it can continue to ferment, but you certainly wouldn't want it to explode. So we have a whole post, as well as in the book, on, on preventing explosions. Basically, you just keep everything in a cooler or a box so that should that happen, the mess is contained. And again, it's not to be afraid of it. It's just more to be aware that this could potentially happen. But if you do let it sit on the counter, let it get nice and tangy. You want it to have that sour flavor, but still be enough to drink. And if it's a little too sour, you can always dilute it with a little bit of water. That will shift the pH. It's like lemon in your water. You still get the full health benefits, but it may not have as an intense an impact on your tongue. Um, now, if you're making it at home, of course, the benefit is there. You have full control over that fermentation process. So typically you'd want to do in a one-gallon batch at least two weeks in a larger batch up to a month, so it has that nice tangy flavor because kombucha does contain known candidicides. Um, phenethyl alcohol and caprylic acid are both contained in kombucha, and they can help suppress the candida. Now, here's what happens. For most people, they end up going through a die-off period, but that die-off can feel like, oh, I'm having an attack when really – I mean, think about it. They're fighting for their lives. Like, they want to retain the dominance that they fought to um, to have in your gut. And so they're not going to go easily. Um, I, I like to call it the, like, vinegar, the vinegar of truth, right? Like, the vinegar is coming in and it's breaking down the biofilm that's been created by the candida in the gut. But they're, you're going to have to go through that die-off period. And some people can't handle it and other people can. For a lot of people, it's somewhere between a week to two weeks. But, again, it's listening to your body, listening to the biofeed back it's giving you, trusting your gut, and going slow. And if it's too intense of a die-off, back it off. You know, um, cut down the amount of kombucha, increase your water, allow your body to flush. And oftentimes what we'll recommend to people if kombucha is just too intense for them to add into their diet right now, Start with water kefir. You can make coconut water kefir. Coconut is known to be very high in caprylic acid as well. So by fermenting the coconut water, you make that more bioavailable. That's been really popular for folks suffering from candida. Or do the milk kefir. It's very nutritious. It's like a drinkable yogurt. It's very diverse in terms of the number of strains. And both of those are going to have different organisms and different properties that can help to rebuild the gut lining before you come back and add the kombucha. Because what the kombucha has that's really special are those healthy acids that detoxify the liver. Um, what that really means is that the gluconic and glucuronic acid, these are acids also created by the liver in the human body. The problem is, is we're so overexposed to toxins, be that from the from the air, from the water, from the food, from the beauty products, from, you know, <laughs> literally anything we come to contact with. If we're not super conscientious about where it's coming from, it could potentially have toxins in it. And so our bodies are just basically under assault. Um, they're in toxic overload, and we don't produce enough of these healthy acids to support healthy liver function. So when you drink kombucha and it has these healthy acids that help, that literally, so what they do, the gluconic and glucuronic acid is they bond to these toxic molecules. Once that bond is created, it can't be broken. So rather than being um, secreted away into our fat and stored in our fat cells where then they can accumulate over time, uh, they are released through hydrolysis, which is the process of elimination or urination. So drinking water with kombucha is great because it also helps to flush out those things that are being released into the system. And this is why some people also have a Herxheimer reaction, which is basically a healing crisis. The body is releasing toxic elements back into the bloodstream, and that can create a negative reaction. If that's a rash, a headache, feeling a little weird, diarrhea, any of those are signs that the body is trying to get rid of something yucky. Right. Um Oftentimes people will misascribe that to whatever, you know, to the kombucha. Be like, oh, the kombucha caused this. Well, the reality is the kombucha is helping you to get rid of it. It's just your right. body may or may not be ready for that process. Exactly. I was just talking to somebody earlier about that. They've got a detox product out. And uh, somebody came back to them and said, oh, this is making me sick. And she was like, no, that's already stuff that's in your body that is, mm. you know, causing you to not function the way you're created to function. 
and that it's part of the process. So you're so right. We've got three minutes before we have to go to the break. I want to let you know, Colleen just bought your book. And also the uh, person who had the question, can you give them some kind of dosage that they could maybe start with? Absolutely. You know, and uh, we get this question all the time, how much is too much to drink? And, of course, our standard reply is trust your gut. But for most people starting out with kombucha, if you're totally new to it, um, two to four ounces. So that's um, half a cup to uh, a quarter cup at a time. Just start slow. Um, let your body get used to having it. Follow with plenty of water. And then this is what we call closing the loop. We need to close the biofeedback loop because so often we're putting things into our bodies not realizing the damage they're creating. Um, but when we start to pay attention to how our bodies feel after we consume foods, and that's why we recommend consuming kombucha on an empty stomach. So take really? those first two ounces on an empty stomach first thing in the morning and just feel how is the kombucha working in my body. So if you take it, if you take it like first thing in the morning, is there a certain amount of time that you should wait before you eat? Now this, no. this is I mean, something that, it, I never heard of. Yeah, no, it's not about like a, and then don't eat at all or anything like that. It's even just 10 minutes sitting with the kombucha, feeling how it's working in your system can give you some clues to how your body's responding to it. You know, if in the first 10 minutes you feel, oh my gosh, I gotta go to the bathroom, well that's a pretty clear sign that it's starting to move some stuff out. If you have it the first 10 minutes, like what happens to me is I'll feel, I will literally feel my organism, my organs relax. Right, And when we remember that the root cause of all dis-ease is stress, whether that's stress from a poor diet, stress from a stressful lifestyle, or stress from um, you know, outside influences, uh, whenever we're able to then relax on any kind of level, that's just allowing our bodies to rebalance. Great. All right, it's 6.59. We're going to go ahead and we're going to take a short music break, and we will be back with Hannah Crumb. The Kombucha Mama to talk more about kombucha and brewing and safety and issues and everything kombucha. So stay tuned. I want a mucha kombucha from you. A little favor I ask you to do It's a magical potion that gets your devotion Let me mocha kombucha from you I want a mocha kombucha from you Such an exotic, mysterious brew I don't care what they think, it's a cool thing to drink Let me mocha kombucha from you I don't want sangria Kombucha is the key to your heart Woo! I want a mucha kombucha from, from you And then I'll sip it the whole day through And I know I can't lose Cause it fights the blues Let I me mucha kombucha from, from you, you. Anytime, oh, yeah. Rich. Thank you. 
All righty, and we are back, I think. That was kind of a short song. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Welcome back. I loved you. it. And did you like that? That was so cool. you got to send me the link. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for the one that you were talking about, but I couldn't find it, and I found that. I found a bunch of other ones that were, like, really funny and stupid. <laughs> the link <laughs> is in the Skype chat. Awesome. Okay, great. All right, so welcome back. You're listening to It's Your Life, Live It to the Fullest. I am your host, Joyce Wheeler, and today is Friday, June 17th, 2016. You're listening to Haggy Shack Radio and Full Spirit Radio. Please remember that we are listener-sponsored, so click that donate button and show us some love. And I am here with the Kabucha Mama, Hannah Crone. Welcome back, Hannah. Thanks for having me. So much fun. Okay, so what I want to talk about is, like, before we had left, you were talking about, like, well, we talked, we answered a question, but the the flavoring. So when we add flavoring, like, for instance, I add juice to mine, and I'll let, let that sit for three days, and then I go ahead and I refrigerate it. Now, my understanding, because you had mentioned that somebody could take kombucha that they bought from the store and let it sit out to continue fermenting. Now, my understanding is that once it's put in the fridge, it stops the fermentation process. Another thing I want to mention is I had never, I've never had an explosion. I've heard about it and it freaked me out when I heard about it. I was like, Oh snap, you know, I got to be careful with this, but I have never had an explosion. I never had a batch go bad. So I'm thinking that maybe I've just been gifted to brew kombucha. There you go. Well, you know, um, I haven't had a lot of explosions myself, but every once in a while. So we have a kombucha museum. Uh, my husband and partner, he's uh, he's been my SCOBY partner in all of this. He's the uh, bacteria to my wild and crazy yeast. Uh, but he had this idea, hey, let's do a kombucha museum, which I love. And for many, for many years, we just kept the kombucha in the bottles, like thinking maybe someday in the future we would – open them up and analyze them and what was, you know, how have they changed over time? You know, you can clearly tell I have that scientist uh, thought process at heart. But what we didn't realize is some of them left in the, in the especially in the beer bottles, they have a thinner glass and they have those crown caps. Um, after several months, um, we ended up with one exploding in the house. And we were so lucky we caught it then. We, we ended up taking the rest of the bottles and, like, throwing them in the yard, and they just exploded everywhere. So yeah. it, you definitely need to be conscientious, especially if you forget a bottle in the back of the cupboard somewhere. Um, I've, I've also heard stories of folks doing that and being awoken by a loud noise. And then also sometimes when you, if you over, see, here's the problem. Sometimes people put too much flavoring in because we really have this concept that more is better. When it comes to kombucha, what it's always been teaching me is less. Less is better. So um, it's very, because it is like vinegar, and, you know, we can infuse all kinds of things into vinegar, and it will extract that flavor and nutrition. We don't need a lot. So a little bit goes a long way. And especially if you're working with juice or things that are really high in sugar, if you put too much in, you actually cause the kombucha to get too sour too quickly as as counterintuitive as that might sound it just it overstimulates the yeast and they end up making too many of those sour compounds as opposed to the kind of more mellow compounds so less is more with kombucha for sure because all i use is juice and mm-hmm. i've never had that happen i've actually been told that, that my kombucha is some of the best that people have tasted well um, you're so. cultivating a great culture then that's terrific now i want a bottle <laughs> when you were talking about explosions, I remember reading uh, where somebody had said that they were transporting some kombucha in their car and one of them exploded. Yeah, well, and kombucha is more mobile than water. So what that means is if your bottles ever fall over, if they don't have a really tight cap in place, they'll leak everywhere. Now, the great thing is as much as the kombucha smell will be there for a little bit, it actually dries really quickly, and probably you're sanitizing the back of your car right. because it's not low pH, so you don't have to worry about it causing any problems there. Colleen said that she had a ginger beer made with apple peels and cores explode when she opened it. She oh, yeah. 
too long without burping it, and she was like, it was all over the kitchen. Oh well, people God. have showed us images of, like, geysering flavorings to their ceilings, and they have, like, green splotches or pink splotches. And so we do have a great post, which I'm happy to share the link with you if you want to post that later, um, that talks about how to minimize the risk from that. And there's a lot of techniques that people use to kind of, you know, the saddest thing about an explosion sometimes is if it's geysering so much, you lose all that kombucha. Well, there's right. quite a few tips and tricks that people have learned, such as, you know, put the bottle in a bowl and place a plastic bag over it. What that does is, you know, even though it comes shooting out of the bottle, it gets captured back into the bowl, and then the plastic bag redirects any liquid coming out of it back into the bowl as well. So um, there are some tips and tricks for preventing it from from hitting your ceiling, but every once in a while... It can go all the way to the ceiling. Now, I'm not wondering if it, that's because there are a, a lot of the brewers that I'm seeing, they're using the bottles that have that, like, cap that flips Swing over. Cup. Yeah. Right. You see, and I use I use just plain mason jars. Well, and mason a- jars will allow the fizz to dissipate. So that's probably why you're not experiencing the same type of geysers. Is because they're not such a tight seal and CO2 is a gas, it might just be seeping out a little bit at a time, and that's why you're not experiencing the same type of issue. Now, the swing tops are great for holding in the carbonation because people really love it, but the, you know, I've I've had a nasty whack on the back of my hand trying to open one of those that was a little too pressurized. So, you definitely want to use caution when opening those. I I always put a towel over it and make sure I'm over a sink and, you know, I'm very cautious now, um, just because of that experience. It, it whacked me hard. <laughs> I think I'll stick my mason jars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you find what works for you and then stick with it. Um, when we used to sell kombucha, we put it in tall bottles, like a uh, 28 ounce, 32 ounce bottles with a nice screw top. And, and even those will sometimes geyser, um, but we always try to keep them over the sink. Colleen says she was really sad because it was so tasty and she only made one bottle. She had to oh. of it. That was it. That's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, it is. So let's talk about flavoring. We talked a little bit about juice and the flavoring. Let's talk about, I know people use herbs. Say they use, um, fruits to, to flavor it. So let's take it. Let's talk about using herbs and, you know, what kind of process and, Absolutely. You know, when I first started flavoring kombucha, that was one of the places I looked to first. Now, here's the reality. Ginger kombucha is the top-selling flavor, and there's a good reason for that. Ginger in humans are a happy symbiosis. Um, It helps with digestion, it's anti-inflammatory, and it just tastes good, right? So most of us really love that feeling we get from consuming ginger. And as kids, I remember being given ginger ale when I had an upset tummy, of course. In a soda format, it's not nearly as good for you as it was um, in a ginger beer format or in a, you know, ginger kombucha format. Um, but ginger is always going to be the most popular. And people, they juice the ginger. They cut and put pieces in there. They might do candied ginger. I've always found that just using a, a few fresh slices uh, gives it the best flavor. And then we have a dry ginger that people really like because it's super easy to use as well. And it doesn't overwhelm you with the intensity of flavor. So as a rule of thumb, the smaller the surface area, the more the less of it you need to use because the more quickly it's a, it's utilized by the microorganisms. Um, so, for instance, if I were to use apple pieces, which I do, I make an apple pie flavor with apple, cinnamon, and uh, chai spice. Uh, okay. I I like to use more of the pieces than I would of the juice, and I personally prefer. This is just my personal preference. I like to use the whole pieces if I can. Now, that's not always uh, easy to do, and it doesn't always give you the best flavor. But the reason I like that is because there's so much that we don't know. You know, sure, we know there's vitamin A in a carrot, but what else is in the carrot that right. either it co-works with the vitamin A or, you know, all the things that we don't know, right? As much as we think we know, there's so much more we actually don't have any concept of of all as at all. So... I've always been a fan of whole pieces of fruit, whole, because what else are we extracting from it? And I don't mean whole, like the entire apple put in there. Like chop it into pieces so it's got a nice small surface area, but I prefer the pieces rather than the juice. Now, the juice is going to be easier to source and get at a store, and um, certainly many people use the juice, and that works great. So you're always working with what works best for you. Um, but I love going to my garden, gathering herbs, and, you know, 
I'm one of these people. I'm making it for myself, right? So when I make it for myself, I might even chew the herbs up a little in my mouth and then put it in the kombucha. And again, remember that low pH in studies has been shown to kill pathogenic organisms on contact. Um, you probably should disinfect your your cutting boards with a little bit of kombucha vinegar and uh, or or spray it on your chicken. You'd probably have a safer cooking experience that way, uh, just because that low pH is so antimicrobial. Okay, so let me ask you this. Um... Like size wise, say somebody's brewing a just a quart of kombucha. How much herbs or fruit should they add to that? I mean, ten percent is our common cutoff. So, I mean, what does that mean in terms of a quart? Maybe it's like, or what I call a single layer. So, whatever the the diameter is of the bottom of your vessel, just kind of putting a single layer at the bottom usually is more than enough flavoring to infuse into your brew. And, of course, because you're going to continue to make it, some batches will be better than others, keeping a log of what you're doing will allow you to create ideal combinations that then you can try to recreate in the future. Because so here's the thing. You'll always tell yourself, oh, I'll remember what I did. But then a few days later when you come back to it and you're like, this is the best kombucha ever. What did I do? You probably won't remember. So um, if you really love playing with the flavors, definitely get yourself a little journal and, and take notes because that will help you uh, recreate those favorite flavors in the future. Okay, so when you're talking about layering, so like you were talking about doing apples, cinnamon, and what was the other one you mentioned? Chai spice, yeah, that's for the apple pie okay. flavor. So would you do like a layer of apples, a layer of chai spice, and a layer of cinnamon? That would probably just... be too much. So with fruit, you do a layer. Um, with herbs and spices, you want to use a little less because, again, um, they can be really intense in flavor. Um, oftentimes, they'll... They have essential oils that also lend a flavor to the brew. So you don't need as much of it because it's already got an intensity to it. Now, when I do my cinnamon, I like to do these cinnamon chips. They're larger. It's like a, it's not as big as a cinnamon roll, like a cinnamon stick, but it's still in larger pieces. You could also do powdered cinnamon if you prefer. Um, and then with the chai spice, it's going to have a little ginger, a little orange peel, a little um, clove and nutmeg and star anise. And so, you know, you just want to be careful working with very aromatic herbs because if you put too much in, it will over overpower the brew and then it might not be as palatable as you were hoping. But okay, so experimentation talking, is the best way to go. Right. So you, now you're talking about using a powder. So if somebody was you say they use the cinnamon powder versus a cinnamon stick, and let's talk about that. Let's you know go back to our quart jar. How much cinnamon would they use if they were using the powder? How much would they use if they were using sticks? I mean, I would probably go eighth of a teaspoon for cinnamon powder versus you know uh, maybe a quarter of a stick. Right, so uh, because of that smaller surface area, we can get away with less in the powdered form versus in the stick form. Now, the book has measurements for one um, for sixteen ounce bottles and for one gallon batches. So, if you're someone who likes uh, to scale and make larger batches, what you'll find though is it isn't equivalent. It's not like you multiply the number of um, or the amount of elements you, you know, ingredients you would use for a 16 ounce bottle to get the one gallon size, you can actually pare it down because again, less is more with kombucha. And so we don't necessarily want to just follow that recipe up. You certainly can to start, but you may find that you can get away with adding less flavoring, which just saves money and maybe produces a more balanced flavor than, you know, overwhelming it with too much flavor. Okay, and we're, if somebody wants to get the book, where can they get that book at? Uh, Amazon.com, your favorite independent bookstore. Those are the two best places. You can also get it at store.kombuchacamp.com, uh, and it's discounted in many of our packages and things like that. So uh, it's, it's you know, check it out on Amazon. It's got over 130 reviews. We're super proud of that. It's been a number one bestseller in some of those uh, great categories, coffee and tea and, and whatnot. So we're, we're really proud of how well it's doing there. Okay, excellent. All right, so I'm looking for the link in the various things you gave me. Oh, you've got your, so if people want to contact, get in touch with you, say on Facebook or just like your page, where should they go? 
Yeah, so you can always drop an email to customer service at kombuchacamp.com. That's camp with a K. We literally answer every single email we receive. So whether you're our client or not, our dedication has always been first and foremost to education and empowerment. And so, you know, no question is too small or too, um, too basic, uh, we're always happy to to help point you in the right direction. Now, those of you who like doing research, come to our website. We have a search bar. You can type in some keywords, Scoby Hotel, PH, uh, different things, and various articles will come up. We have some really great flavoring recipes on the website as well, many of which made their way into the book. Um, but there's far more in the book than there are on the website. But there's some on the website that aren't in the book either. So uh, so it's really a fun site to tool around on and find all kinds of information about kombucha. And in uh, another month or so, we'll be ready to launch our kombucha research paper portal. So we have gathered a database of almost 200 research papers on kombucha from around the world. There's wow. just a little sliver of that is in the book, in the appendix. There's a health um, like a symptom specific section, but everything we present is all based on these research studies that have been done, whether they're on human cells or on mice or, or different animals. Um, we, we present the findings there so that people can find it. And here's the reality. Anecdotally, experientially, people have been noticing that it helps with all these benefits. And, you know, science and scientific inquiry is really looking at things that already exist and trying to explain it through the underlying mechanisms, right, by controlling the different variables. So the reality is kombucha already does these wonderful things, whether we have the research papers to support that or not. Of course, in our current worldview, we think, oh, well, science and scientific inquiry is the only way in which we can verify that something actually exists. And I think we miss out on a huge body of evidence that literally comes from human beings consuming these foods and deriving certain nutritional benefits from them. I mean, it's really basic, right? If you give a living organism what it needs in order to thrive, it will. It's it's pretty simple. Exactly. So you do consultations, we do, yeah. So we, uh, so uh, you mentioned in my bio that uh, I'm also president of Kombucha Brewers International. I, for those of you out there who've been drinking kombucha for a while, you might remember that in 2010 there was a kind of a kerfuffle around kombucha, and Whole Foods decided to remove all the brands from their shelves. Um, it was called a labeling issue, and many brands had to reformulate before they could bring their product back to market. The reason for that was, um, like all fermented foods, kombucha produce, produces a trace amount of alcohol. Now, the alcohol serves a couple of very specific functions. First of all, it's a vital nutrient. I realize that we've, uh, again, been in the grips of a prohibition hangover. We're also in a country founded by Puritans. These are people too uptight for the British. So um, we have a very uh, long and contentious history with alcohol in the United States, and our laws reflect the way in which we consider it, which is more as a controlled substance rather than a medicine, which is what it has always been for all of human history. Now, of course, like all medicines, we shouldn't be taking it every single day. You know, maybe we need to consume it more in balance as opposed to over-consuming it or consuming it in in situations where it's out of balance. Um, But again, these trace amounts are non-inebriating. They don't create a toxic response in the body, and in fact, those healthy acids support healthy liver function, so it actually does the exact opposite of what most alcohol does. But what alcohol does do is it'll take nutritional elements from any herbs or barks or whatever we're infusing into them and pass it on to you, the imbiber. So, you know, you think about tinctures and cough syrups. All of these have an alcohol base because um, alcohol not only is a preservative, it not only extracts the nutrition, it also relaxes the organism. And it allows your body to absorb that nutrition more easily. So it does serve a very specific uh, benefit um, in, in anything that it's present in. And the great thing about kombucha is it's not intoxicating. Um, however, we still have a low threshold for taxation in this country. And to be honest, I feel like I've gotten a little off course here. But my point was, <laughs> in all of this conversation, was to say that, um, you know, kombucha is something that when we consume it in balance has a really net positive effect on the body. Let me ask you this. You know, we're talking about the alcohol content. And I many times I'll tell my husband, I was like, well, you know, here, take, take a little bit of kombucha and drink it. 
but he's a truck driver, mm. so he can't have any kind of alcohol levels in his system. So he'll let it, most of the time he'll refuse to drink it if he has to drive because he's afraid that that might be in his blood system. And if he gets stopped, it's well, going to... And that's a fear I've heard echoed by other people as well. And again, um, oh, that's right. I was talking about why it was taken off the shelves. Um, well, again, the reality is, and I, you know, many brewers have done this where they'll take kombucha, they'll have a breathalyzer and they'll try to blow anything. And even if they're sitting there, even the best of them, it's really hard to consume a lot of kombucha in a short period of time because it's so nutrient dense. Your body very quickly goes, okay, I've had enough. Um, you know, and so it's really difficult to consume enough to even register on a breathalyzer. So I totally understand that concern. And this is, again, where this confusion comes in for people because now we have over 21 kombuchas, which are kombuchas produced under a beer and wine license, even though they don't have high quantities of alcohol. It's more than the legal um, threshold for taxation, which is half a percent. Um, and so this, again, creates a lot of confusion. But let's think about it like this. First of all, in many countries, European countries, Australia, Canada even, their alcohol, their definition of an alcoholic beverage is higher than ours. It's, you know, 1%, 1.5%. Uh, moreover, when we look at uh, Indonesia, which really loves kombucha, they have a very vibrant kombucha industry there and a long history of consuming it, they're also a very Muslim country, and alcohol is considered haram or prohibited. Well, kombucha right. is considered halal or beneficial because it is not intoxicating. So, again, even in many cultures where alcohol is taboo, kombucha is something that's accepted because it does not have those same negative effects associated with higher alcohol beverages. So, you know, this is part of why we formed the trade association, Kombucha Brewers International, is when this happened in 2010, we recognized that there wasn't any any organization, any touch point for the industry that Whole Foods or anyone else could go to to get real information on kombucha. You know, it's hard to just take a brand's word for it. You know, there's always a perception, well, the brand's going to say whatever they need in order to you know, protect themselves. Um, but the reality is, is that this is true for kombucha and that this isn't actually an intoxicating product. And so by forming the trade association in 2014, um, my husband and I started that with 40 members and we've grown to over 130 in just two and a half years. I mean, imagine how quickly, how much demand there is for this product. And the reason is, is it's coming at a time when people are incredibly toxic. Uh, I really feel like this is why kombucha is coming in into uh, popularity right now is because people really need it. And we think of it as the 21st century yogurt. I mean, you guys probably remember, yogurt used to be something that old people in the mountains of Europe ate, and they lived to 100 years old. <laughs> and then it was something that those awesome hippies, gotta love the hippies, are doing on their countertops, and it's like kind of weird. And then it turns into this multi-billion dollar industry. And again, with the intersection of all the research on the human microbiome and how vital it is that we understand we've been waging germ warfare, we've been killing off our immune systems unwittingly, you know, people are hungry, they're thirsty, literally, for foods that help replenish their microbiome, that replenish their bacteria force field. So um, I really feel like kombucha is coming here now to serve a very specific purpose in our nutritional needs. Okay, so as far as your consultations go, Tell all right, that's what all this was about. Okay, the consultation, right. So this is uh, about us working with the commercial industry. Um, so uh, I've been a master oh, brewer oh, and have been oh. consulting companies for many, many years. And it was through those relationships um, that people said, hey, you guys, why don't you do this? And we're like, oh. All right, we will. <laughs> because we just, we love kombucha. We love um, people having access to kombucha. And so whether you're a startup who's new to kombucha and just trying to figure out what to do next, if you're someone who's already making kombucha but want to scale up into larger production, if you need cultures at wholesale, you know, we we have all of those resources in place. And the funny thing is you'll go to my store, you'll see the commercial consultation there. You won't see any reviews for it. But the reality is we've helped so many people with their commercial process, and they're just mostly too shy to leave a review. Um, but the there are also brands out there that will happily tell you that their entire um, beverage is sourced 
you know, they, they started with our cultures and they continue to propagate them moving forward. So we feel like we have a lot of little um, kombucha camp brands that are flourishing as their own uh, ready-to-drink kombucha brands out in the world. And Hannah, you want to give your website again for the listening audience? Absolutely. KombuchaCamp.com. That's camp with a K. Uh, if you want to learn more about the trade association, that's KombuchaBrewers.org. So anyone who's brewing kombucha who wants to derive benefit, um, we are working very hard to get, um, you know, to protect our products and to uh, promote them around the world. And that's our mission at, at Kombucha Brewers International, where I'm the president. And... Um, and chief bottle washer. <laughs> the reality is uh, we're still very much a grassroots organization, and it's really the passion of our brewers that inspires inspires the work. All right. There's some things I'd like to talk about. Um, I'd like to talk about kombucha and the vitamins. I'd also like to talk about kombucha and pets, radiation. And I'd yeah. also like to discuss what we can do with these, at, you know, these scobbies so, that keep multiplying yeah. personally. To me, they're alive. I cannot get rid of them because I feel like I'm killing something. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone in that so feeling. So I've got, and, you know, like, many other brewers. Um, do I have my hotel? In the book, hotel, you'll find like, several recipes for working with the cultures, and there was another thing that is yeah, I was going to bring up, too, product. earlier when you were talking. One of you our most popular products, and I bring Some people say scoobies. Some people say scoobies. Well, I'm not sure if anybody's hearing me, but it seems we've got connection troubles again. So I'm just waiting for the server to come back up and for Skype to come back. Because I sure don't want to have to reboot everything because then we'll be down for about 10 minutes because it takes for a long time for my modem to boot back up. Normally I have to pull the battery out and unplug it and put the battery back in and start all over. And 